webinars now since COVID. We're really happy you could join us. Um, this is an exciting day. I just want to remind you that at the end of uh, Dr. Aurora's um, talk, there will be a very short electronic evaluation survey in the chat. So we always like to get your feedback for these very exciting seminars. So I'm going to turn it over. I'm, I'm Ellen Hahn. I'm the director of UK CARES. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Aaron Haynes, the deputy director, who will uh, introduce Manisha Aurora. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, and it is my absolute privilege um, and pleasure today to um, introduce you to one of the um, most fantastic, innovative, and exciting um, research scientists that I think um, is working in the field of environmental health today. Um, and that is Dr. Manish Arora. He is the uh, Bayer Wald Professor and Vice Chairman of Environmental Medicine and Public Health at Mount Sinai in New York. His research is focusing on the central role of time in the environmental health um, interaction uh, research studies. Um, today, I'm excited that he will be sharing with you some of this cutting edge novel work um, using examples from his own biomarkers um, from research studies um, in which he is beginning to reconstruct um, fine scale temporal uptake of exposures, which I'm just so excited that everyone gets to hear um, about this, um, this new frontier. Um, and for his contribution to environmental health research, um, Dr. Manish Arora received the U.S. Presidential Medal in 2015. Um, and he came to the United States. He's an immigrant to the United States, and he came uh, from Australia among one of the countries that he's from. So today you'll hear his uh, career trajectory and the exciting new work that he is launching. So without further ado, um, Dr. Aurora, um, we're happy to have you here in Kentucky. Thank you for joining. My pleasure. Um, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, we've been friends for, as, as we were discussing earlier, almost 10 years, so it, it's great. <clears throat> I was looking forward to visiting in person, but I think the, the universe had different plans. Maybe maybe next year. Um, thank you, everyone. A real privilege. Privilege. Um, I'm going to share some of uh, our work um, at Mount Sinai, which is here in New York. Um, increasingly, my team's uh, interest has been on understanding how the very physical nature of time impacts how humans and environment interact. Uh, let, let me start off by giving you uh, a prelude into critical windows of susceptibility. Now, this, uh, this magazine cover is almost a, a decade old, and it, it made headlines, obviously, it, uh, top tier magazine, saying that what happens to us before we are born impacts us for the rest of our life. So this was a real shift in our foundational sciences, such as toxicology, which were based on concentrations, and because now we are saying when is just as important as, as how much. Let me give you a real scientific example, not just a general one. This is, this is a, 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 an image from, a, from another group that I have used many times, and it really fascinates me. They're looking at brain density using MRI, fetal MRI imaging, from 13 weeks to 21 weeks, so over this eight-week period. And if you look at this graph, the density of the brain, a global measure of how complex all the things that are happening inside our brain tissue, uh, quadruple over a period of these eight weeks. So a lot is happening and it's happening very quickly. This leads us to two questions on two aspects, which are often intermingled and, and confused, but I, I want to separate them today. And that is exposure timing and exposure dynamics. We all know as environmental scientists that, you know, you can pretty much sequence your genome at any time and except for the epigenetic changes, you'll get the full picture. Uh, so timing is not that essential for genomic studies. But for us, uh, how do we look back in time if that cover of Time magazine was right that, you know, around here in the, before we are born or soon after that is where our health trajectory starts? And this is the question you can all ask yourself. What was your exposure before you were born? And it's a very difficult question to answer. Sure, you can use questionnaires and the, and the such, maybe hospital record data, I work in, you know, do some work in Sweden where they have medical records going all the way back. 
But none of that is satisfactory because we are exposed to thousands of different things. So how do we measure everything in a quantitative, detailed, reliable manner, right from the stresses to the inflammatory response to the toxicants to the good stuff like the nutrients? For the longest period, I thought that was the main challenge. And only recently I realized that's exposure timing. There's another challenge, which is exposure dynamics. And that is this. If I could go back in time and say, you know, in the third trimester, I was exposed to so much of different things, that's not enough because unlike our genome, our environment changes by the hour. What we breathe in on our commute, or at least when we used to commute to work, is very different to what we breathe in at night. What we eat in the morning, the, I have a, start my day with a coffee and my day with a beer. So our nutrition is also very different. How do we look back in time and reconstruct those fine scale dynamics? <clears throat> Today, I'm gonna to share several technologies. I'll focus on one that my lab works on, but I'll share a few others from, from other labs as well. And measuring fetal exposure has other challenges, not just going back in time, but there's the placenta, which partitions, which regulate some things, you know, like cadmium is very well blocked. Manganese is actively transported and lead passes through passively. So we have all of these different kinetics that the placenta is imposing on different aspects of what we are exposed to. So you can't just measure the mother's blood samples and say, I know what's happening to the fetus. You also can't directly sample the fetus in, in large studies. So there are many challenges here. I work on teeth. There's an amazing fact about, well, there are several amazing facts about teeth. One is that Every time a child sheds a baby tooth, and every child is going to shed at least 20 baby teeth, they're handing you what is mostly fetal tissue. I don't know of any other event in, in a person's life where they non-invasively hand, hand you fetal tissue because teeth start developing towards the end of the first trimester. And then they form in this incremental manner, just like growth rings in a tree. And we can visualize those growth rings and we can map them using nuclear beam methods like lasers and synchrotrons and you know, proton probes and construct a daily profile. So we have this opportunity to collect teeth. We have 20 opportunities actually, and they're stable at room temperature. So I encourage all of you, anyone who has a cohort, just bank them. You never know what all we can do with them in the future. Like I mentioned, there are other technologies out there. I don't, I don't want this talk to be only about the stuff I'm doing. You can measure uh, lead in bone. You know, that, those that has been around for 20 years. It gives you a cumulative measure of the past several decades. There's this very nice uh, satellite-based remote sensing technology. My, my friend and colleague at Ben Gurion University, his name is Itai Klug, he does that. Alan Just, who's a part of my group here at Mount Sinai, does that. And they generate these daily profiles of air pollution. You can also wear these silicone wristbands. Took me a while to find one with your logo because when you put Kentucky in, in a search engine, the top few hits are all about fried chicken. And there are no complaints about that. Okay, so what, what is the type of data we generate from the tooth biomarkers? I won't go into the lab method, I'm happy to discuss them later, but this is what we generate. So this boy was about 10 years old living in Mexico when he gave us a tooth. He's part of my chair, Bob Wright's cohort. We got a tooth and we built this very fine scale weekly temporal profile. We can do subweekly, but it just takes us longer. On the vertical axis, you have the concentration of lead normalized to calcium. And on the X axis, you have developmental time. So we've gone well into the second trimester, even though the child is 10 years old. Imagine if you did a blood test anywhere around the first year of life or later, the, the child's blood levels look fairly normal, but they actually had a high level of exposure just before birth. So this is a way to uncover critical exposure periods during fetal development you know, by going back in time. <clears throat> and this data has been very useful to us. We've, we've, we've made, we've found new associations, new links that previously were not found. Uh, most of my publications are on metals because it's harder to study organics. We actually had to stop our organic work, go back and develop our own hardware. We built our own robot. Uh, which you know does high throughput micro sampling. We are building another type of a new type of laser that can do organic methods. But this is what we can measure currently. And this this graph was generated by my a member of my team, Lauren Petrick. We can generate 
we've, we've done more than 50,000 signatures, but I really believe in the 10,000 that, that we can filter down with some high levels of QA, QC. I'm only showing you 160 here. Uh, I've chosen these examples to give you a sense of what all we can measure. Here on the top left, you see per, per fluoro compounds, so external exposures. We also measure you know, things like parabens and thalates, things that come in through our, our you know, consumer products. We measure uh, aspects of uh, the structural building blocks of our physiology, amino acids and peptides. But what links us, what links our exposures to our physiology, they're intervening biological response pathways. For example, if you look at arachidonic acid, you would know that it, 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 it takes part in cell-to-cell -cell communication. It, it uh, takes part in inflammation. So here is a way to measure from a single sample everything from exposure to our biological response, to molecular phenotyping, and then linking it to a clinical phenotype. We no longer just have to measure exposure and then a clinically measured outcome. We can build a whole pathway model and we have the time signature. So we can say, well, I want to look at the timing of perfluor exposures before the inflammatory signal. I can separate them temporally. Okay. <clears throat> How do we apply this to really complex diseases? Because they have always been the challenge. Genomics hasn't delivered as much as we would have wanted it to because the environmental piece, we always knew this, but you know, it took us a while to get the message out there. The environmental piece is crucial to understanding complex diseases. I'm gonna use the example of autism spectrum disorder because that's where I, I've done some work and I have some data. It's a scary graph, you know, the, the year I was born, the prevalence was one in 5,000. Now it's about one to 2%. Um, so it's rising. Some of this rise is admittedly due to better diagnostics, but it's not all that, you know, there's something that we have done to our environment to bring this on ourselves and worse to bring it on our children. So now there's a real concern about autism spectrum disorder, how do we look after folks with autism, uh, autism, severe autism, who will later on need institutionalized care? So there's a, what is known as an autism tsunami heading towards us. And there's a big missing piece here, early diagnosis. So if you have diabetes, you expect to go and get a blood test done. And if you have a thyroid dysfunction, you go get a blood test done. But for many of the mental health disorders, you go to a doctor and they look at you. They evaluate you without a biomarker. So autism is diagnosed quite late. The average age is between three and four years where the clinicians can make an accurate diagnosis. Look at this very stylized, very simplistic graph. Our language centers, our sensory pathways, all of the stuff that is impacted in autism, it is most pliable in the first year of life. And by the time we are making accurate diagnosis, it's a bit late. So not only is this a critical window of susceptibility, it's actually a critical window of opportunity. And this has been proven in high risk populations where if you give early, you diagnose early, you give an early intervention, you actually have a better outcome. But we cannot deliver this care, we cannot deliver existing therapy because we don't diagnose at the right time. I'm going to take you on this journey, uh, a journey of you know, discovery and a lot of self-doubt and realizing we made many mistakes along the way, but it ends with an over 90% accurate biomarker that can be operationalized in the first six months of life. We started this study in Sweden because they have twins. They have one of the world's best twin studies. And because autism has a heritable component, we wanted to control for the genetics. We even had monozygotic twins who are discordant for autism. We replicated in the UK, in New York, and in Texas. So we were very thorough about, about replicating this work. And we used teeth and hair, these unusual matrices, you know, we're not just looking at blood and, and urine. Okay, I, I won't spend too much time on the study design, but I'm gonna show the initial results from twins. A very small study, but it's very hard to find discordant twins for autism who have teeth and are part of, you know, national studies where the clinical diagnosis is, is rock solid. So this is what we found after you know, many years of tooth collection, debating with journals about publishing them, Nature Communications kept us under review for over a year, got six reviewers, three rounds of review, a lot of back and forth, all because of this one, and I admit it, complicated graph. On the y-axis, we're looking at differences between case control pairs. These are all siblings. 
and we're looking at different metals here, I'm only showing you zinc. On the x-axis, we have time spread in weeks, but we actually had about daily resolution here. Zero on the y-axis means there's no difference. If the graph dips below, cases have less. If the graph goes above the zero line, cases have more. Uh, the black line is our distributed lag regression model, or distributed lag model. Uh, the gray band is 95% confidence interval. Then we further adjust it because these are twins. There's a clustering effect. And then our statistician, Chris Jennings, is extra conservative. And she put these vertical bars, which is a holmes bond ferroni correction. So she tries to get rid of significant p-values, about the only statistician I know who, who does that. But that's who I'm working with. So God, God bless her. Um, now, what we see here is that there is a significant difference. There is a critical window but it only exists for this fleeting time between minus 10 weeks and plus four weeks. If you do the same analysis here, you don't see that difference. This difference exists in time. There are people who grind up teeth and may get you one average measure and say, well, it's some time weighted average. The, whatever type of average you want to do of this whole signature is a zero, right? So you completely miss this because it only exists for this. And this is for me the definition of critical windows. After we uh, published this, uh, some, some people, folks did animal models on uh, uh, mutant mice where the zinc pathways were d disrupted and, and purpose on purpose and showed that, that this actually works even in an animal model. So it was very satisfying. It got into a top tier journal. 80 you know, um, uh, news agencies published this, including the, the pinnacle of you know, media, which was Goop. Um, I didn't get to speak to Gwyneth Paltrow, but once you're in Goop, you know, you, you know you've made it. Um, and that's where, like any, any scientist, I started really looking at the data, and I realized that, man, I, I missed something very important. You know, we always know certain things, but we don't always do them. And that graph is not that great at all even though it's been covered by the media and it was a you know, great journal and everything, this, it's missing something very, very important. And over the last three years since that was published has been a real discovery of uh, self-discovery as well as work on trying to come up with a better science that can help environmental health. So I'm going to set the tone for, for this argument. You don't have to believe me that I was wrong. I'm going to prove to you that I was wrong. <clears throat> first uh, with a hypothetical study and then by real data. So let's start a good study. And we've got some great epidemiologists in the audience. I'm, I'm gonna work hard to make this hypothetical example gold standard. Let's say you do a prospective study and you don't collect samples every year, you do it three to six months. And when you find your results, you don't just replicate them in a, one different population, you replicate them two times. And this is what your data looks like. And plus you're not biased by using only targeted analysis. You're not just looking under the lamppost, you're doing untargeted analysis and letting the data speak to you. And as you find incident cases, you have all the control in your cohort and you see this again and again. Again, this is hypothetical. The compound D is higher in controls and lower in cases. And this pattern replicates twice over. Let me use an zinc as an example. This is not a real study, but I want to use something that we all have some understanding of. It's an essential nutrient. It's good for us. So there's no, it's no fancy chemical out there that nobody knows anything about. And we measure it in serum, something that we've all worked with. And we are good epidemiologists. So we use identical gold standard collection methods and at the same time of day, just like you would do with cortisol or something else, we are worried about time. And you work with good, good lab scientists who use excellent you know, QA, QC, the same identical method. They randomize the cases and control, so there's no bias. The blue are controls, the red are cases. And it confirms the, the final analysis on thousands of patients, can, uh, uh, participants, confirms that controls have more and cases have less. Now use the colors red and blue, and red is lower than blue, but please know that that does not have any political implications at, at all. So I, I'm, I'm not politically inclined in any way. And th those symbols are entirely for scientific purposes. Okay. Now, this, what I'm showing you, is exactly what I had done in this graph, only I had done it at multiple time points, right? 
and it makes sense. You replicated it and you've done everything. At this point, when I ask the audience, what would you do at the end of this study? Because that's what I have shown. And I get two common answers. Usually in a live setting, you know, I ask the people and they, they reply, what would you do? And I get two most common answers I get. And you know, as I'm saying that you can think about what you would answer as well. And the answers are, well, we should set up an animal study and supplement the, the, you know, the, the case mice with zinc. Or some people say, let's do a human trial since zinc is not a toxic substance. Uh, let's do a randomized controlled trial and supplement the cases with zinc. You know why I'm saying this because that's not the right answer. So let me show you what's really happening. Let me show you what is environmental biodynamics. My favorite paper of all time by, by scales. You will see this elegant four hourly sampling. It's a small number of subjects, um, all of roughly about the age of postdocs, which, which explains why they were able to get away with repeated re rectal temperature sampling as well. And then there are many jokes there which are not suitable for, 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 for a recorded meeting. Offline, we, we can talk about that. But you see this nice sine wave curve. I didn't believe it, so you know I did my own uh, single person saliva testing and you see that sine wave in a single person saliva collected every few hours as well. But it's out of phase. So let me show you what the actual results of that very nice epidemiological study are. These are the controls. I've just copied the sine wave from the healthy controls here. These are the cases. Because we are good epidemiologists, we measured them at the same amount of time. And therefore, right around here, if you just focus on this blue pixel and this red pixel, you get that result. So this is not a difference of concentration at all. This is a difference that exists entirely in dynamics. Let me explain this with a very different analogy. If you have two musicians playing together and one musician is playing well and the other musician is playing poorly, turning up the volume of the person playing poorly is not going to fix the problem. It's actually going to make it worse, right? The same way pushing this person up at this time is not going to solve this problem. But much of what we do, you know, much of what I have done is that, is the static view of repeated static pictures of, of science. It's like looking at a photograph of a car and asking yourself, well, how fast is that car going? Right? You can have multiple pictures, but at best you will come up with an average rate. You will not understand the dynamics, the quality of driving of that car. So let me start working on a more formal definition. So environmental omics is what we all do. We measure metals, we measure organics, and we come up with some measure of intensity or concentration. In environmental biodynamics, we don't look at concentration. We look at measures that are, you know, at least before I started, were, I had never seen them in environmental science. So these are trajectories and orbits. How is your metabolism humming? And the other difference in omics, especially these days, is we are so you know, infatuated with big data. Environmental biodynamics doesn't care if the data is big or small. It cares whether data is deep, whether it, it uses good epidemiologic practice, good theory, good biological understanding. I really like this title, Environmental Biodynamics. I hope somebody writes a book about it one day. I think uh, Aaron would agree. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna share a little video with you now. It took us a long time and years of method development, and I've shown this video many times. I'm very, very proud of this data, which was um, generated by my colleague, Dr. Christine Austin, and it was analyzed by Dr. Paul Curtin, whose names were on the authorship slide. From a single sample collected around the age of 50, we went back to birth and reconstructed the first 10 years of biodynamics at the week by week resolution. So it's like saying we took 500 sequential blood samples, but 50 years back in time. I'm gonna move out of this uh, slide share to a different one, so please give me a few seconds to do that. Okay, there we go. So I'm, I hope you can see this jumble of, of red dots. If Aaron, if you shake your head in the vertical, I'll know that you can, you can see, the, see the video slide, can we? Oh, good, thank you. This is calcium and it's, it's it's intensity mapped at different points in time in 3D space. We just call it phase space. And you will see that it's moving around in this orbit, very tight orbit, but it's also moving around in a global 
orbit. The reason I call them orbit is one easy way to understand them is how our planet will revolve around its axis, which is what it's doing in this tight cluster. It's also moving around the sun in a, in a bigger orbit. And this is real data. This is not simulated data. At each point, we have a bunch of measures of calcium. So this is what our metabolism looks like. And we all know that our metabolism is constantly dynamic. It's not some static measure you get on your annual physical report where they say your calcium level is this much within this huge ranges, right? Sometimes look at the manganese range on a blood test. If you go to the Mayo Clinic website, no, no disrespect to them, but it's a quadrupling range. I, I can't believe anybody's manganese levels in blood can be quadrupled and they're still perfectly healthy. Also note that this is not completely random, right? I'll stop this video here. It's not completely random because if it was random, it would just be all over. Sorry, I almost left the meeting there instead of pressing the share screen. Okay, uh, Aaron, again, are you back at my PowerPoint slide? Okay, great. So if it was completely random, you can imagine a particle moving around the room in which you're sitting. It would visit every spot in that room. And essentially, if it left a little dot there, you would end up with a cube, a solid cube. So this was not random data. It's also not highly deterministic data like, like a pendulum would be. So, you know, I'm very proud of this graph because for me, this was the first time I actually saw metabolism. I could visually see what's happening. And it's for the simplest compound you could study, calcium, right? This is not for some complex pathway. So we have a lot of work to do, but we're trying to do that with all the 10,000 compounds I showed you earlier. But this is, not a manage, this is not something that requires super complicated statistical tools. We can use existing statistical methods. And like I said, in that autism study we started in Sweden, we saw if you just make a new index of the complexity of the orbits, cases have a more complex orbit and control, oh, sorry, controls have a more complex orbit and cases have something that breaks around this 3.7 mark. We could replicate that in New York in Texas, in, in UK, and in a pooled analysis. So it, it replicated multiple times and that what surprised us. We were thinking the, the, the proportional measures would replicate, but these are absolute measures. Something is happening around 3.6, 3.7 that separates kids with autism spectrum disorder and those that don't have it. Something that is a break in the orbit. When you do a quantitative concentration-based analysis, we can't replicate those differences. And so it led us, and this is a classifier, not a diagnostic tool. I must stress that, you know, diagnostics are FDA approved. There's a whole process. I don't want to, you know, over, over play the, the importance of this. It is just a research tool. And we have a, a, a classifier that's almost 95% accurate. And classifiers don't work like that. If I want better sensitivity, I can compromise on the specificity and have better sensitivity. And of course, I can do the test twice and get very good sensitivity and specificity. So, we're, we're moving in the right direction. But this is what I like to describe as, an, as a highway of innovation. You don't just you know, become an autism scientist. For me, the idea is this core technology of environmental biodynamics, and you have an exit path whenever you make a discovery that can be shared with the public. So autism is just one exit path of this highway of innovation. We have other conditions we are studying, like ALS, which happened at 50 years of age or, or later or at least that's when we detect it. Psychosis at the age of 20. And all of this, what, what I want to stress is all of these signatures are coming from before birth or the first year of life. And as you would expect, autism and ADHD cluster close together, but the other conditions are further apart. We're also applying this to you know, conditions that are very far from neurodevelopmental uh, conditions, like we're looking at this group of people who have rejected their kidney transplant. Why is that happening? Can we predict beforehand that you are going to run into a rejection phase. Because by the time it's a full ball rejection, you can't do, you wasted the organ, but also you can't help the patient, right? Before I conclude, I, I just want to say that uh, in, in about, you know, I still have a, about 15 odd minutes, that we need to start thinking about, you know, precision environmental medicine. You can call it whatever you like. Uh, people love the word exposomics for now. Let's see how long that lasts, you know, but, for me, it's still studying the environment. And we are very good at looking forward. We say, well, here's a child. Let's measure everything that we can, the environment in its broadest term, uh, genetics included, all the omics included. And then let's say, you know, can we prevent future disease? You know, can we work towards identifying bio 
chemical pathways and even develop pharmaceutical intervention. Sure. But that's not how clinicians meet their patients, right? We don't meet everybody at the beginning of their life and say, let me, I'm, I'm in charge now. We meet them at this end of life, right? We meet them at diagnosis when something is wrong. Because at the end of the day, we are not a public health system. We are a public sick system, right? We're a public care system. We only come to the doctor when, you know, we have no other choice. And we can measure everything. But now we also need to look back and say, well, how do we customize that treatment? Not just based on genomics, because you know, that has been an important piece, but obviously it's not enough. That's why genomic therapies aren't changing the world as we thought they would. And we can start looking forward as well to prevent future exposure. And we do that in autism. We, we will tell them if there's a lead exposure source, we need to look at that because children with autism exhibit pica. They put non-food items into their mouth, so we need to keep the environment clean. The nutrition is impacted and, and so on. So precision environmental medicine has that extra challenge of looking back in time. And, and I would say not just time, but dynamics. I always like to end with this, uh, in the scientific part of my talk with this, with this example. Remember the study from scales, you know, things are moving up and down throughout the day at hourly intervals. How do, you, how do I give a message to you to take home and say, well, you know, you can apply environmental dynamics right away in everyday life. You don't need synchrotrons and lasers and proton probes to do this. I want to show you a picture of my family. Uh, some of you might know, but some of you don't. Uh, I have triplet daughters. They were about six odd months of age. That's, that's their mom there. And suddenly we had this problem. Well, I, the problem I was facing was I saw them and I thought, oh God, that's almost a million dollars in college tuition. My, my, my wife was having a problem that suddenly the number of babies outnumber the number of breasts. So how do you breastfeed all the children? And one day, uh, being the dad that I am, I'm, I'm late coming from work and I see this, that the, the, the nanny has left. My wife's, you know, got two struck uh, attached to her and one also getting breast milk from a bottle. You might think they're all being breastfed, right? So take a moment to think that that's not the case. Something is wrong here, right? If I had known about environmental biodynamics, I would do something differently here. And this is what I would do differently. Just like blood and saliva and body temperature are going like this, the breast milk that is from here is not temporally aligned. These two are getting the breast milk of now. She's getting the breast milk of something that was expressed in the morning or a different time. Our doctor never told us. They said, okay, you know, put the day of the breast milk expression and after two days, throw it out. I would say put the hour or at least morning, afternoon, evening, night, so that when you have to breastfeed that child, you are using the temporally correct breast milk, because timing is not at the level of days, it's at the level of hours, that's the dynamics. Anyway, um, very proud of her for doing all of this with a smile on her face, I, I, I would not be able to. I will switch gears and you would have seen that in my introductory slide, I'm just the committee chair, I'm not the chair of the department by any means. Um, I'm just the committee chair of race, diversity and inclusion. So I usually used to end my talk here. Nowadays, I, I ended at a much more difficult juncture. And this is really difficult for me because I'm, in a way I'm doing it almost entirely for personal reasons. The story is, is like this. I was about six, eight months ago before the pandemic, I was at the, I, I went to DC. I'm a failed portrait artist. I, I, I do portraiture, but they always turn out looking terrible. Um, and I was at the portrait gallery and, and I was standing in front of our former President Obama's portrait. And right next to that was a, uh, was a bust of Einstein. I thought, what? Einstein was president? I'm sure that's true. And it's not. But there was something that, that really resonated with me, something that I was feeling for a long time, but I, I just couldn't express. For me, the story starts in my early childhood in Africa. I lived on the border of Rhodesia. We lived on the Zambian side back then. It was Rhodesia and Rhodesia had apartheid. Nowadays it's called Zambia. My father is very dark skinned, so he faced challenges. And I, I don't need to go into that. My life's been very privileged. It really hurts me to see that after 
so many years, my entire lifetime. It took me a lifetime to earn the privilege of being called an American because I've lived in five different countries. And by far, and remember those countries are not all poor countries. In fact, I've lived in countries that are far wealthier, that have better roads. I would easily say better healthcare systems. We still have that disparity here. It also hurts me that so many of my academic colleagues are not part of the conversation because academia doesn't encourage that. Often it for, you know, discourages us from taking a stance because it appears to be political or biased. It also scares me that one day my, my children or my grandchildren will ask me, you know, at that moment in history, what did you do? And that's all I really want to say here. And I think we should all speak up. We should all at least say something. Okay, I'll stop there. Welcome any questions, political or non. Again, those red and blue colors on my graphs have no political affiliation, in case anybody still remembers that. <laughs> Um, I will leave my slides up, I think, in case somebody wants to see the graphs. Um, and I will leave these folks up because they, they need a bit more time to be acknowledged. I'll, I'll just leave them up, but please fire away with, with any question. And again, thank you very much for this opportunity. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Orr. Everyone is clapping. We have to hear through the, you can see the claps thank you. going up. And you're, um, your words are uh, quite appreciated. Uh, we're getting comments in the in the chat on on that. Um, so, I, Dr. Rohr, I am familiar with your biodynamic. Um, this I'm going to call it a revolutionary uh, perspective and direction for environmental health. It we have countless there's so many research studies that have done you know traditional epi we measure an exposure and it's usually cross-sectional maybe it's um repeated over time but maybe it's not the right time time of day it's it's it really changes the way we think about science so have you thought of how this could be applied how can we actually make this uh practical feasible uh doable in real life yeah, so so, so we, are, we are working very hard on that. And that's why I briefly mentioned some other assays. For example, the, 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 the remote sensing data, it's publicly available. Uh, I'm trying hard now to offer many studies, some very highly subsidized analysis, because it's not just computational. I, I have what I like to call, you know, hard costs where you have to buy a laser, you have to, you know, buy standards, but make it very easily accessible to everybody to build these public databases of very fine scale temporal measures. But the challenge is actually not just a, te a technological one. It's, it's the mindset, right? It's, it's, it's what we have been like, I've been indoctrinated to think a certain way. I won't name any places, but I was giving a talk and somebody was very adamant and criticized my work saying, that's too much data, you know? Because in the end, we'll all end up averaging it anyway. So we need to move away from that and question some very fundamental aspects of the way we think about time. For example, you know, if I ask you what are the criteria for causality, Bradford Hill or Cox postulates, everyone can sort of partially, you know, agree or disagree on most of them, but everyone says the absolute criteria is, is the temporal order. Cause must happen before effect. Let, let me challenge you on that. Let me say you have two bodies, two planets, A and B which is exerting its gravity on the other first. They're both impacting each other. Gravity cannot be escaped, right? My question is, who's impacting each other first? The answer is they're both impacting each other at the same point of time. There's a cause-effect cause relationship, but the temporal order need not be there, right? In the same way, we often assume things um, and develop statistical methods about you know, regression models and things like that, that, that don't take into account these factors. Like I, could, you know, I don't want to ramble on, there, there are many other aspects, but to answer your question more directly, we, we have now good technology. We are doing hair biomarker work, toenails, teeth, and all of these can be collected non-invasively. They're stable at room temperature, but we also need some fundamental shift in the way we think. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a question about uh, adult teeth or non, 
Maybe teeth. Oh, yes, you? yes, absolutely. So we recently published a study on ALS. All the ALS data is from adult teeth because, you know, they're in their 40s and 50s and older. Um, and so we got the, and the calcium um, video I showed you was from an adult tooth. So we absolutely study adult teeth. It's actually easier in some ways because adult teeth are so much bigger. We have more material to analyze. And we are building all those, you know, 50,000 compound maps and we can cover a larger time period. Uh, adult teeth start around birth and then, you know, we can get up to 15 years. The, the places where we find it easiest to collect is, you know, at the orthodontist's office, when you're putting on braces, they might remove the premolars to make space. At the oral surgeon's office for wisdom teeth, and that's almost universal now, almost everybody's getting wisdom teeth removed at some stage in their life. But also at you know, if, if, you're, if your health outcome is really severe, like an ALS, you can't look after your oral health. So the, and the dentist says, well, there's only five or six teeth left that are functional, the rest are rotten. I can't give you a denture because the denture your caretaker can clean. They take it out of your mouth, clean it for you, put it back in. Let's get rid of those three or four teeth that are remaining. And so we got very good quality teeth from the ALS cases. Actually, the poor quality of tooth was from the controls because people without a condition are not going to get their teeth extracted without some reason. So absolutely permanent teeth are actually extremely valuable and we, we analyze them routinely now. Awesome, um, thank you for that. We have another question about um, using baby teeth um, later in life to look at um, pregnancy complications. Yeah, so recently we developed a biomarker for a very fine scale fetal inflammation. So it's, it's, it's a daily profile of the, the fetus's inflammation uh, moving up and down. And this is just early days. We just sort of finalized the assay, but we are interested in seeing if the fetal inflammation is actually ref a reflection of the mother or the, the global quality of the pregnancy. And then look at pregnancy complications that way. Um, just like, you know, we are so used to taking a mother's biomarker and saying, oh, the feet this must be happening in the fetus. Why can't we work backwards, right? Why can't we look at the fetal biomarker and say, well, I think this is what was happening to the mother. Wow, that's brand new um, and that's very exciting. Um, so there's another add on question for this related to birth defects. Are you able to, the question is the window of susceptibility is very early in development for cardiac birth defects. Yeah. Are there good tools to look at the fine scale dynamics and exposure at this early developmental stage. That's hard, but I think by early development, I think you're talking about the first trimester and teeth start developing at the end of the first trimester. So, okay. you know, we, we are missing that window. So the satellite remote sensing is a good approach because, you know, but that's external. So you don't have, you don't have a direct fetal measure, but you can measure fine scale daily exposures over pregnancy. And I'm happy to link you with Itai Klub or Alan just if, if you send me an email, I, I don't do that myself. The other biomarker that we are recently working on is hair. So I have triplets. My wife is of Irish Australian descent. Two of them were born with the Irish genes and were almost bald. One took after me, was born with a massive head of hair. Now hair grow at about a centimeter a month, right? So I could go back into some of their fetal time, probably not the first trimester because hair is not present then as far as I know, but we have other ways of looking at that. You can also collect the mother's hair and start mapping backwards. The newer assays that we are developing don't need a whole clump of hair, they just need one strand. So we can generate you know, hundreds of features of chemical features from a single strand of hair. So um, yes, it's a very difficult, challenging question. I think the easiest uh, avenue for the birth defect study would be the air pollution model. I think that is superior than what I'm doing for the first trimester. Wow, a single strand of hair is quite, um, unusual. Do you, do you see like a rush on your lab, like people, everyone across the world sending you hair samples to tell again, them about you know, themselves again, uh, and their exposure? American science is unique in that way. When I was in Australia, I had to beg and plead for, for anything. Um, here, uh, you know, my lab has been very fortunate, good NIH funding, but also support from foundations, you know, Families will come and not, not just wealthy families, mom and pops will come and, you know, leave us 10,000 in their estate, their will, you know. So I started off with the, you know, 3,000 square feet lab with five people. Now I have a 20,000 square foot lab with 40 scientists full time. They work even during COVID, they'll work in shifts. You know, we have two dozen mass specs humming away. So yes, there's a rush, but 
it's a privilege, right? So I can always deliver more. If, uh, if there's more demand, I can ask for more and I can deliver more. And we are part of the HERE program. So we are definitely happy to help you through HERE. And you can just look at their website. It's a very altruistic program. Uh, the earlier you apply, the better, because you know it's getting more popular. So as we have more applications, the, the pay line keeps getting harder and harder. Awesome. Any other questions from the audience? I think this has been a fantastic uh, seminar presentation, Manish. We're all, I, I'm, you, you change me every time we speak and I hear your, your new ideas. I, my science needs to change. So thank you for spurring us on. Thank you. And, and I'm going to go have a KFC. One more, tomorrow. Ellen. Ellen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to bring this up because there are people on this call that do rate on work. And I also want to mention that the survey is in your chat. Okay. We would love your input. Just a very brief survey. It's in the chat box. Um, before this meeting, I had talked to Manish about the work that we do in Radon and how I am very interested in pursuing baby teeth or really maybe adult teeth. I guess I'd love you to talk a little bit about that um, because Radon exposure is one of those things that we do not have a biomarker for. So could you talk a little bit about, I know you haven't done it yet, but yes, yes, any, anything you can share. It's something I'm very interested on and, and for the simple reason that you know the, the greats who started tooth biomarker research, people don't often realize, but Linus Pauling is the only person to win two Nobel Prizes by himself. So Mary Curie did it, but she shared them with her husband, probably because he, he, he wouldn't stop whining and you know would, would be very, very you know, difficult at home. But Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes. We all know about his Nobel Prize in chemistry. We don't know about his second Nobel Prize, which was the Peace Prize. And he used baby teeth to study radiation. And using those baby teeth, he was able to convince the government to ban above ground nuclear tests. And that's why we blow our, some of our test weapons deep underground in caves and stuff so that the radiation doesn't impact us. So the tooth biomarkers started off with a radiation study, right? They use strontium isotopes to study radiation, but that's a very different kind of radiation, a very high level of radiation. After the Fukushima disaster, uh, I, I helped the Japanese national study for their tooth work. Uh, we work closely together. I'm going to be analyzing some uh, teeth for that radiation exposure. Along those paths, I'm very interested in studying radon because you know, nuclear disasters are bad and have a huge impact, but they're finite in time and usually impact a finite population. In the US, the radon exposure, before I bought my house, I had to get it tested for radon. I never heard of that actually in any other country I've lived. So I was like, oh my God, what have I walked into? There's lead exposure in these old houses, radon, so on. But it, it's everywhere, just people don't know enough about it. I'm not giving a very scientific answer because I'm just trying to sort of convey the interest we have. We are working on the methods and I'll, I'll work with my analytical chemist to dig up this old project which sort of halted around COVID to, to look at biomarkers of radon exposure. The path we are taking is because the geology of radon is such that it comes from certain types of rocks. It's not just you have to measure radon directly you can measure some co-exposures. Those have two advantages. They help you validate the exposure because of things that like, we did some pesticide studies that contain manganese. So manganese levels and pesticide levels in teeth were moving together. So we know, okay, we are on the right track. So it's a validation tool, but often it's also a good surrogate like smoking and cadmium, right? So in NHANES, we, we see the cadmium levels and the smoking questionnaire responses move together. So we know that this is probably where it's coming from and it's a good surrogate. But yeah, I can't give you a better answer than that because it's early days for, but I'm, I'm, I'm always excited to collaborate on, on, the, on these challenges. Yeah, I don't know if my KGS partners are on here or not, but we will definitely follow up with you and uh, share a paper that we wrote together on the kinds of rock and we'll go from there. But Thank that, you, that, Manish. That, that, that would be great. Uh, I look forward to it. Awesome. All right, well, Aaron, um, I guess if there aren't any other questions, I just wanna thank everybody today and certainly thank Manish. This has been a fabulous talk, very uh, enlightening. I just wanna encourage you that if you have not uh, applied for membership at UK Cares and you think you might be interested, check out our website and uh, come next time. Thank you. I, I will, I, I look forward to it.
again, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We Thanks, will give everyone. You, yeah, we will give you Kentucky chicken eventually, Manish. <laughs> I, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> no, and no salads as a side. I want that mashed potato and gravy. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll do um, some kind of delivery system. We can, we'll make it happen. Well, Thank I'll you. Dri drive down the road and get it myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, Manish. Thanks, everyone.